All right. Welcome to West Virginia and Commonplace. Today I have with me Richard Olberger. Richard Olberger has a big, big, strong story to share. Before he gets started, let me move over here. And this is one of those things where uh, if I had me an AV guy, I would be a little bit more correct of what I'm doing. He has a book. Before he tells us anything, that's called The Zero Method. Before he even dives into the book, I just wanted to say the name of the book. You can pick this book up on uh, Kindle and you can get this in paperback release. We're going to talk about it later. But the nostalgic question that is always asked on this show is, who is this person? So, Richard, just like any other show before we even get started, I'm going to ask you that question. Who is Richard Olberger? Wow. In one word. <laughs> clinical psychologist he's a guy next door he's a, a kid in a grown-up's body and um you know the book is about first of all shout out to west virginia my nephew got married there i was there in may also awesome. i reached out about doing your show and um so love love the people of west virginia great sports state uh but i'm a clinical psychologist um my father did not have a college degree but i thought he played a psychologist in my living room with all my friends that came over. He always loved listening and he loved sports. So I think I've used those tools between sports, love, and the love of human interaction, the love of human spirit to really learn to listen and also to take that into the realm of podcasting. So, you know, I'm a father, I'm a sports coach. I'm a sports psychologist and I do wherever I can to take my cape off and go into areas where people need help. So if that means hospitals where doctors and nurses are really burnt out, I do that. If that means sports teams where they're having trouble figuring out how to get along and how to succeed, I do that. And if that means skid row where there's homelessness. So um, the beauty is my journey has taken me into many different areas where I get to see and experience the different ways in which mankind struggles and the different ways in which we touch success, beauty, and excellence. Okay, so you have experience, you have expertise in trauma and performance psychology. So That's let's correct. dive into a scenario real quick. Um, I was a, a high school, a collegiate, elementary school, middle school athlete, I, I wrestled. So me, for instance, if I had a, a losing slump or something, you could help me somewhere in that interaction, correct? Correct. And is that, is that what you actually do for a living? Like, do you help people? Where, where does your help come in in the psychology realm? Like, give us an example of something because I know sure, we got HIPAA sports laws. Psychology, I mean, nowadays, sports psychology has become more commonplace. Um, so the way my life works is I've never been tied to a major university like West Virginia, which I'm sure has on staff some people right out of college, right? Or a lot of military programs also bringing in performance psychology because they want to know what happens to you when you're under extreme stress, right? For a few days without sleep, uh, how do you stay focused? Uh, if you, God forbid, your unit goes through something negative or painful, how do you let it go? How do you process your grief and then get ready for the next challenge? So there are certain techniques and tools that can be taught cookie cutter. And there's certain things that depend on an, on an individual psychology, right? So if you yourself or my client and you lost several events, I might be looking at a lot of athletes, we hear them at the college level, you see them, you're like, oh man, this guy was all state. He, and then all of a sudden you get to a certain level and you meet the challenge that is either equal or greater to you. And you experience loss, you experience defeat. And the problem is for the athlete, what are the stories you tell yourself about that defeat? Do you start to tell yourself, you know, does anger take over? Does sadness cloud your vision? Do you start to project forward and now believe you can't win? Right? So do you believe you're a failure? What happens when you start telling yourself stories? And we all develop beliefs that trigger core beliefs where they come from our families, right? If I'm not good at football, if I'm not good at wrestling, then who am I? If my right. family were good at wrestling. So we try and separate. First of all, look at these different layers of activation. What's triggering what? And although a loss may be painful and disappointing, we still want to build up the part of you that's strong, that's training. So it's kind of reconditioning the way we hold our emotions 
And the process, just like with your breath, letting go of the garbage or negativity or fears. So we don't pretend they're not there. We just help clients to acknowledge them and to release them. And you do this with routines like anything else, like you do for your show, right? We got the stuff we do before we record. We got our pre-performance routines. We got our mid-game routines, right? You see on the end, you see Giannis Antetokounmpo, you know, talking to himself, Carl Malone used to talk to himself on the free throw line. You see NBA players, right? What are they doing on the sideline to adjust themselves? And then after the game, right? You've got time to, to have a lens, look at the camera, what did I do differently? What was happening to me when I was speaking so fast on this podcast and I was mumbling my words? And <laughs> <laughs> what was up with me that day? <laughs> yeah. So we need that reflection, right? To, to, to kind of look back and go, okay, I noticed I was anxious. I was a little fearful. That question put me on the spot or I was a little off that day. I was a little tired. So we look at all these elements of what we control. Like the, the, the term is we control the controllables. What are the things we can look at that we can control? What are the things that we don't control? And can we get okay with that there's always going to be an element of an opponent or an opportunity bringing us something we're not ready for? Okay, okay, and I like that. So so there's a lot of different directions depending on what the athlete's going through. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit about you because the greatest thing about coming on a podcast and you're, and he is a podcast. We'll talk about that later. Um, is when you're on someone else's show, you become more personable, uh, things about you, people learn a different side because we tell about ourselves to a certain degree. We give a certain level of intimacy of ourselves, but we never give that full intimacy because we're not the one asking ourselves the questions. you know, someone else, if they ask us, then they can get an answer. So in light, what started you on this journey? And I'm going to put a little filler in here so you can think about this real quick, because I already I know you already got the answer. But here's the thing. Like, I, I learned a long time ago, like what started me on my journey. I have I'm from Appalachia, so I hear random folklores and all this stuff. So I tell these folklores and stories that happen in life um, that have happened to me. I tell them like folklore. So I might as well do a podcast in 2018 or 2017. I was like, hey, I'll start podcasting. I'll get out here, learn the chops, learn the business. And that's why I do what I do. And then in my normal job, I started doing that because everybody in my family remodels or does something inside some type of big box store. So that's our our lineage. We're we're remodelers, wrestlers, and podcasters. So now, Richard, please tell us how you got your start um, doing what you're doing. And then to get really deep, deep with it, tell us about a disappointment and a failure in what you've done. Mm. I love that. Remodelers, wrestlers, and podcasters. Man, I'll see if mine rhyme like yours. Well, that was beautiful. Um, You know, I'd say there, what I talk about in the zero method, I know we're not on the book yet, but is kind of the shadow, the checklist goals. And my mom was a guidance counselor. I feel like I was surrounded by a den of teachers and therapists. So, and I probably played one at the kitchen table. (laughs) Um, especially in my own psychology. And I talk about it in the book, my, my father lost his job right when I was entering college. So learning how to keep it together or be a listener was a survival skill. And, and, and like I said, I think I also picked up when we're looking for attributes from our loved ones, my father's career was never something he seemed to love, but the attributes of being a listener and caring about other human beings he seemed to excel at it, even if no one ever saw it. I saw it in my home. I witnessed, I experienced, and, um, you know, very caring, loving man, very gentle. Um, So I think those things gave me this DNA to follow the pursuit of the healing profession. It's not something that a lot of men go into in terms of psychology. Now, I don't think I really asked myself the, the P question, right? What am I passionate about? What am I purposeful about? So. I think the sports psychology voice in my head only started to go off once I got into the field of psychology and realized this is, this is checking the list, but the list doesn't give you passion. It doesn't excite you and it doesn't excite others. It doesn't inspire others. So I'm very excited now, you know, when someone reaches out to me and asks for my help in the field of sports psychology, because I feel like they get to experience that passionate, they get to experience the lineage that I'm allowed to come out, which is pursue your dream, 
right? What's it going to take for you to be able to pursue this thing you love? So I love that space. And in terms of being a podcaster, you know, I always tell clients this, and I think it's great for your listeners too, because I was terrified of doing a podcast <laughs> for, for having, excuse the siren, for having a PhD, for having all the certifications in the world. My friend, Peter Stovey, who you'll find on all my early editions of Richard Listens, right? Uh, he is a quadriplegic. He had me as his co-host. And this man who's fearless in life, who you see him every night out on the town, <laughs> not going to blow up your game, Peter, but he's out there, he's dating, he's going, he's going to places and he has no limitations. And he would look at me in the studio and I'd be sitting there quiet, afraid to ask the difficult question, afraid to tell my story. So there's something to being uncomfortable. I don't know about failing, but something about noticing yourself sweat and noticing yourself um, really feel out of your comfort zone, but know you're growing. Uh, in terms of failure, I'd say the biggest wound for me, I took a job in LA County as a crisis responder, you know, oh, oh man, <laughs> oh man, they told me high profile, all of a sudden, I'm the guy telling the policeman where to go on a scene. I'm telling the ER doctors what to do. I'm telling the principals of schools what to do. So I think, you know, authority and um, power and a little bit of that went to my head and a little bit of ego about um, being so important about solving crises for other people. And I think that that got ahead of me and I was not happy. And when people feel powerful and unhappy, we've got plenty of examples of that. Uh, but yes. it's a really dangerous thing as a man, because on the one hand, I felt like I was, you know, accomplishing and earning. And on the other hand, I think I lacked self-awareness in terms of maybe how I was treating others and how that might be affecting my work environment. So overnight, I got sent from working in West LA during the daytime uh, with unlimited overtime to uh, working on Skid Row. So Whoa. overnight, without a choice, like literally hopping over bodies, hopping over puddles uh, on the way to work in a double wide trailer on Skid Row, Los Angeles. So, wow. So yes, it was like extremely crushing and debilitating and was like, yeah, um, it's like going back to a state with, of, of unknown and really feeling helpless and powerless. And without the right tools and support, that could be a very scary place in terms of identity, right? Because everything we know or everything we thought is now taken away. Um, and now I know, and this is why I wrote the book, that that was really a gift because you start back at the basics, you know, daily, I had to go for walks. I had to appreciate what it was like to help individuals on Skid Row get off the street, get a meal, um, any bit of therapy or anything I could do to get them a discount bus pass. So you start to see humanity differently. You got to be inspired by people who really choose to go down there with all their heart rather than do jobs just for ego and status. Uh, and the end of the day, I just retooled my chest. I did every training possible. I did everything I could to improve myself professionally and to create an out for myself, to create a path forward, to be in control of my destiny and to do the work that I wanted to do because no amount of money or power or status was going to make up for knowing in your heart that you're, you're kind of selling yourself out. And I feel like that's where I was at. And I don't think it's a good recipe. I think it's scary. I think it can lead to a lot of depression, anxiety. Uh, we see this in high performers a lot, right? Where it's just never enough, never enough money. It's never enough success. Uh, so I'm so thankful though for that gift because it sent me back inwards. It sent me back into doing therapy of my own, which I think I had a lot of stigmas against as a man, as, as, as much as it's cliche. Oh, we got to do it, put your own, do your own work. I wasn't willing to walk that walk until I was tested, until I was pushed Under, to the brink. Understandable. So you got humble when you were down there in Skid Row. So That's let's right. get into let's get into the zero method. There, Same it thing. sounds like it, it kind of seems like it came from out of Skid Row. Is that correct? 
It came from out of Skid Row, it came from my journey into learning what I saw in, in terms of getting beyond the checklist, in terms of looking at as a man, what are the things I see that block us getting closer to what we need, that, that block us from getting vulnerable? Um, so in this, in this case, the metaphor without giving away everything that's in the book, we start at level four and we move down to zero. Zero being kind of the state of no ego, being in complete connection, being in harmony and flow. So, you know, and moving down the levels to getting towards closer to your soul and getting closer to your true purpose. So humble in yourself. Sometimes that starts. Yeah, go ahead. So humble in yourself, basically, to a certain degree. Humble in yourself and, and some things that we don't look at, right? Who's in our on our team? Who's in our tribe? Who are we connected to? Are we around the kind of community or environment that brings us up and gets us closer to some, or is it something that's keeping us kind of stuck at a certain one of our levels or levels of just um, ego or levels of superficiality, right? We only we know if we're taking it comfortable on cruise control, uh, or do we have negative people who are putting us down, holding us back, right? Uh, telling us what we can't be and what we can't do. <laughs> so, you know, taking stock of your, your support systems, um, taking a look at, do you have a mentor, right? If you did want somebody who could help you grow and pursue that dream in, in music or in storytelling or in podcasting, who would you go to, right? If you could. Uh, so getting close to, you know, emotionally, right? Where do you see yourself? What's your purpose if you had one? Uh, if you don't know, we do some exercises. Every chapter has a small exercise to help you look inside and look at, right, where are the areas that I want to grow? Where could I grow if I wanted to? Um, so it's kind of an all-encompassing look at getting a little bit closer to, um, you know, who are our heroes? Who do we look up to? Uh, where can we get mentorship from? um and, and and doing some more self-work right for some men this may be the beginning right they may not be ready to make time or go to therapy have a lot of stigmas around it but i know each one of us right it's not even about what other people think are we a hero to ourselves are we the most powerful vision and version of ourselves do you even allow yourself to dream that big or are we held back by obligation and responsibility like a lot of the the stories, what's the narrative we're telling ourselves? So I can't walk in any other man's shoes. I, I can't say what they handle. I know men, some men carry some pretty heavy things. Um, and I know that some men, if they allow themselves, can use those heavy things to inspire others. So that's my goal to help you become, hey, and why not? There's nothing wrong with being super successful along the way. Right. So true. Like so true. Day, right. <laughs> if my job is to tell a story and use a podcast, why aren't I on Twitch? Why aren't I going next level global? Like what's stopping me from going to my next level? If that's my potential, is it fear? Is it doubt? I'm afraid what people will think, say, do, you know, do I not ask for support to build my team? So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go into the author uh, perspective of writing a book. How did you get inspired to write a book? Because here's my thing. I wrote a book one time, put it on. Uh, I went through KDP, which is Kindle stuff, put it out there. And to me, I wrote it and then I took it back off the market real fast because I wasn't confident in what I wrote. It was something I started as a, a paper in college when I was, uh, I forget what it was, MLA or whatever format we were writing in back then. I wrote it and people gave it a lot of praise. They were like, turn it into a book. And I realized that I didn't at the time have the chops to write a book. I should have, you know, met with people or learned a little bit more about the process because everything we do in life has a process to it. Just like what you do in sports psychology, um, just like what we even do in, in podcasting, because we both learn something every day from someone about something. So what just made you decide that, hey, I need to write a book? Well, you just said it right there, right? Like, oh, are you, a, oh, the world sees, oh, you're a podcaster and you're reaching 20,000 listeners, right? But you just said it. I tell stories. I listen to stories. So when you tap into what your gift is or your passion. So for me, my passion I, I mentioned was about working with athletes. And then what happened in the world at the same time, you know, around the same time, the pandemic was coming in, which we'll get to in a minute. But basically what I decided to do, and I always make a joke about it because I think my wife thought I was just trying to get out of grocery shopping is I, I needed help. I wanted to build a skill. 
I realized from the podcast that all this knowledge in my head and all this book material wasn't getting conveyed. And I was only reaching, I mean, how many people can I see in a day on a busy day? Six to eight. Right. Right. And sometimes they're the same people repeated, which I love and I'm lucky for. But if your goal is to reach more people, reach those that may not have access to therapy, then the podcast or a book opens you up to all different kinds of media, all different ways of connecting. So I took, uh, I met with a writing coach. I interviewed a few people and I found someone who understood what I was writing about athletes and understood that I was trying to teach skills. And they really pulled out of me the storytelling. So it was a painful process of over a year of getting me out of intellectual material that would fill a textbook and get me into storytelling, get me into talking about ways to to convey messages that would be received so it's both communication learning and it's also like was coaching for me so that was something I invested in even about how to write how to structure a book how to brainstorm and it was very uncomfortable this habit you know it was but it was something that I wanted to grow so I don't know if the manifestation of a book had to be the result so (laughs) But that was what kept me going. Like, I like the idea of creating expertise. I like that when I go in a room or come on a podcast, I can leave your listeners with one thing, even if they don't come to me in a session, even if they themselves don't need it, they may know one person in their lives. So when it comes to the things that I've seen on Skid Row or dealing with suicide assessment or dealing with grief and loss, right, you yourself may not be in that place, but chances are, you know, more and more we're coming, when we get beyond the lens with a lot of our people close to us, there's someone struggling. And yes. if you could do anything in your power to help them, I'm sure you would. So the book became a tool. And um, along the way, you know, I had someone who helped me build my website. They said, you know, I think working on athletes, you're only going to reach a really small niche. And at the same time, I was doing my own men's work dealing with the uh, my grief of my father. And they said, why not make this a tribute to him? Why not open up the stories of how you've dealt with things and bring in what you were saying, the vulnerability, that breaking the stigma that in psychology, you can't talk about yourself or you can't reveal what you're working on. I think that getting beyond that is the next level. I think that's where we're at. I think that's what clients need from me. And that's fine if, if therapists are more traditional uh, obviously the session is still about my client, but I think there's some things that when other people know you've been through or hear the stories, it can inspire them. So true. Right. That's what you're talking about. The art of storytelling. When we hear about what's happened before as the generations before what happened in the region you're from, what happened in your culture, what happened in your, you know, uh, it, it, the wisdom traditions that get passed on through folklore, whether they're true or some of them in, a little bit of myth, it <laughs> inspires, it, it frees us up to know we're not in it alone and that others have faced it. So uh, that's the inspiration I want to give through the book is just you're not alone. And even if it is your first time going into some of these areas, there's no one who has it all down. There's nobody who's perfect or hasn't made mistakes or been through a major failure uh, to get where they are today. Okay. Now you talked about a topic that we were going to definitely get into. COVID. How did COVID shape, mold, or reassemble you in every facet that you want to talk wow. about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's unlimited. I mean, first of all, um, my business was, I had a business model that was not my passion that was probably crumbling right before COVID. But when COVID started, whatever that was here in Los Angeles, March, mid March of 2020, I think I was down to four private practice clients, you know, and all of a sudden I closed my office from like my driveway. So it opened up this laptop. I always joke. I went to Costco like the week before and wondered if I'd use it. Now it's like, it's glued (laughs) to me no matter where I go. (laughs) It hasn't had a day off, poor guy. Right. So telehealth, the podcasting. I started recording in some days, three podcasts a day, right? I went from one or two a month to, and and, and all of a sudden people had time to talk. So it, it opened me up to tremendous, like some of my childhood heroes, people from across the country, across the globe, different time zones. So listening to stories, trying to add value and make meaning literally from people's closets, 
you know, um, it, it felt so human and yet so empowering. So that was a beautiful thing that it did. I also caught COVID. I had people in my office that worked for Google and that worked for Cedar sinai Hospital. So I caught it very early on and it was, I caught it bad and it really humbled me being isolated, cut off from my family and being really, you know, vulnerable with your life, uh, I think wakes you up to go, I better get on top of who do I want to help? And I literally like watching the news and seeing all the doctors getting burdened with what they were facing. I literally kind of said like a prayer out loud, like, hey, if I can make a difference in any way, please let me help them. And sure enough, I got a call that they needed somebody to go back in, talk about full circle, 5 p.m. to midnight, midnight to 3 a.m. at Cedar sinai Hospital. And so I planted myself there and I was there for all the night shift. And, and you know, it, it was sad. If it, I mean, literally, if they lost somebody, if somebody passed that day, they could come right in. They didn't have to wait to get help. And I think it really opened me up to that whole population of caregivers and nurses and doctors that are just so understaffed and overwhelmed. And it's really hard to reach them if you don't come to them. You have to heal the healer. You have to go to there. It's a whole different model for caring because you, you, you're you vulnerable the minute you step in. Just like when we go down to Skid Row or go into a crisis, we are really vulnerable. And so I'm so thankful. It's created a whole nother area. I still part-time work in the hospital to, to give back to the doctors. So I feel like a little bit more uh, you know thankful that I can be there to provide a little bit of support and uh, take a load off, right? Uh, if they see a hard day or if they're just having a tough time at home and need a, just a place to scream it out or cry it out that they don't have to bury all their feelings, you know, just to be there and show up every day. And that's an amazing thing. I want to tell you personally, thank you for that. Now, one thing we do on this show, um, and this is another one of those nostalgic things that we do, we have this thing called the shameless plug. The shameless plug is where you tell everybody where they can meet, greet you, over the internet or wherever your call to action is to where people can get in touch with you. Could you do that real quick for us, Richard? Oh man, the shameless plug. I will do yeah. that. Gladly. Thank you. Uh, you can always at Richard listens on Instagram, uh, all the social media, Twitter, Facebook is also at Richard listens uh, website, richardlistens.com. You can pick up the book there or on Amazon and the zero method. You can also get that on the site or like was mentioned earlier on Kindle, please pick up a copy. It's only a couple bucks and I'll make a great stocking stuffer for someone you know and love. And I'll be at the Barnes and Noble at the Grove here in Los Angeles, January 15th, 12 to two, come out, get your books signed before watching your playoff football. And that's an amazing thing about being on Twitch and being live because someone's going to get this and the regular podcast listeners, they'll get this episode a little bit later, but anybody that listens or for the next two weeks on Twitch, you'll be able to hear this. So definitely make sure you uh, head over to everywhere Richard said, and uh, you get in touch with him. Now we do another show inside this show. We have a bunch of series because we, that's how we were able not to niche down. We just do a bunch of series to take care of things. So we have this thing that we used to do called Podcast Collides. Podcast Collides was an episode where we would bring on a podcaster, talk to them about their show, get a little bit of insight on that. So real quick, we're going to go vintage and I'm going to give you two questions from up there. Now, you have your podcast. You do it avidly. You've been doing it for quite some time. What was the most difficult thing for you starting out podcasting? You know, I used to call it a podcast and it was a live radio show to begin with. So um, I think it's really hard to reach out to the guests that you want. And it's hard to do it in a professional way and to do it in a way. Um, it's hard not to be an imposter. It's hard not to feel like, well, on some level you're new and these are experienced people. And so, you know, to get really into self-loathing around that and that you don't belong and therefore, you know, not bringing your full authentic truth and passion because you're discounting yourself. So I think that's really hard. The second thing is some of the, you know, like if you're, you know, a little bit beyond the technology gap, maybe that, that someone like yourself is right, that not knowing 
how to use the correct equipment or editing or software, asking for help. I think, you know, especially if you're an expert in one realm, I'm a PhD, I have so many other experts out there that want to get in this field. So learning what, where the gaps are, learning who to go to or who can help you or uh, outsourcing maybe some of the parts of it so that you can be present what you're good at. I think that's one of the challenges, right? And if you could own that, hey, this <laughs> my editing's taken care of by this software, like you told me about before we went <laughs> yes. on live, or this person, it takes a load off and lets you be present without being overwhelmed and anxious and under delivering. Yes, I say automation is the key in podcasting. People fail to realize that that, that certain simple parts of automation, even if it goes to how you post things online, because I don't even post things online. I have business suite from Meta or Facebook, whatever it's called. I set the post up on a Sunday. They go for the whole month, the whole 30 days in a month. And then I go on with my life. Uh, Podcasting, I had to put inside a bubble. I had to figure out how can I do this without consuming so much time? Because I've seen so many people do that too. So let's go on to to the next thing. Um, Now, everybody has this idea inside podcasting that you should have a dream guest. There should be someone that you have not attained on your show that should be a guest. Me personally, I don't have that anymore because what I found is that every person you meet is so unique that just meeting you and talking to you now, just by looking at your picture on there, you can't tell nothing until you talk to you. So that was an amazing thing for me there. Like, you know, you've got a lot of personality, not saying your pictures don't, but what I'm saying is it's a, you know, it's a lot more personality and stuff going on there because, you know, a picture doesn't tell much. It just shows an, an adjective basically. So for you, have you had your dream guest one? Or are you in the position that you like how things are and you would never need a dream guest? Well, it's been hard for me lately, you know, to to focus on being a guest on others' podcasts. And actually, I've been saying no to some recordings lately because I really want to focus on getting the book out there. And for me to focus is really important and because I've told so many uh, stories. But, um, you know, I always talk about uh, Gabor Mate, who's got a book called The Body Says No, uh, a mentor of mine. So I do think he would be my dream guest uh, and probably, right, there's some uh, famous, famous athlete from my childhood that, that I'd love to have on there. You know, who knows? Maybe maybe mm-hmm. Eli Manning. I don't know. OK, but, but I think what you said was so beautiful and true. I've had four time Olympic gold medalists. I've had professional fighters and NBA players, but it's only because it comes organically, right? I got into MMA fighters, not because, you know, I was rubbing, you know, knuckles with, uh, you know, um, the most famous people. I got into it because my camper from growing up is the dentist for the Brooklyn Nets. So the more I trust the people that I've loved and cared for, the network that I have, the more I invest in how curious I am about the people I know, I am amazed by their skills, talents, passions, and, and sometimes who they know. And sometimes people will come to you and say, I have one or two people for you. I'd love to introduce you. So I'm just so in awe of those moments. And, and usually it's just by me being a little bit more curious instead of writing someone off and going, you know, oh yeah, we don't have anything in common or, you know, that, that I get revealed guests and every guest brings to you something new another area i just had a guy you know he's from the professional ultimate frisbee league my most recent whoa i didn't even know there was such a thing (laughs) wow next thing you're gonna tell tell me about dodgeball after that you're gonna tell tell, tell me about some dodgeball hey if you if it is a professional dodgeballer out there bring it let's do it (laughs) what's a west virginia sport we could host about um, well, you know, West Virginia, we're actually, when we talk about NCAA sports real quick, and this is a nod to West Virginia, um, our rifle, riflemen, we are the premier rifle team in the in the United States. If you yeah. go back and if you if someone looks that up right now and you look at how many national titles we have, we don't have no national titles in football, half or subpar in basketball and other sports, but you put a rifle in these people's hands and they are, you know, they're all from all over the country. Most of them end up at West Point or wherever, but if you got a rifle, we can shoot. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a big sport here now. So we've done all that. Uh, another part of this show, we pay homage to a news magazine. Me and you were about, about around the same age. I'm 37. Um, when we were growing up on Friday nights, there was a TV show called 2020. 
2020 had John Stossel. He was on there. He was a comedian, um, comic relief for the show. He had informative stuff, but he was a comedian. Diane Sawyer was on there too. And Diane Sawyer was on point with her questions. It was a certain way that she uh, put those questions out there. And it's a certain way she could make someone have make a make a portrayal of themselves out of her words. But then there was one other person, Barbara Walters. Now, Barbara Walters might be overrated. She might be like Hulk Hogan or something. She might be a little overrated because she was at the end of the show. But at 1042, between that time and 1050, she came on there and she interviewed somebody. And she made you question your thoughts on that person. She made you question their ability to even answer her questions up until 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes she ran over to 1105. The news wasn't good or something bad didn't happen. You know, they let her run over. But between these three people, you had three different questions. And these three different questions that you got are part of the interrogative thing that we do in podcasting when we ask questions. So, Richard, you're on the hot seat. It's your 2020 time. Are you ready? Okay. Let's get All it. right. So you've been out here and you got a book. You've lived a very illustrious life, even if you don't want to say so. <laughs> but there's one thing that's missing. There's something that's eluding you. It's time for a TED Talk. Now, your TED Talk, you're in California, and I haven't been to California in about a few years. So we're going to just use one of my favorite universities. And shout out to everybody at the University of California, Riverside. Or, yeah, we can use them. University of California, Riverside. You're here to give a TED Talk. Give me the opening statement of your TED Talk. The opening statement will be probably one of the first chapters for my book. The first step to going forward is through slowing down. Okay. All right. right. So we'll, the, we can, the path we... to going forward starts with slowing down. So. Okay. So you do good with or... that speech. All right. So you, <laughs> I'll you need do... to refine it a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll give you a second. Like we're role playing right now. So you, you did good with that. Well, you get a call from a prestigious university, nothing on you guys at Riverside, but we're going to say Stanford. Stanford comes knocking. So you're on this TED Talk tour and you see a client that you haven't seen in over eight years. They want you to autograph the zero method. What do you write inside that book to that person you knew eight years ago, but you don't really know now? What do you tell them? Hmm. Tricky question because often I'm inspired. And usually I'm inspired by what I see going on. So sometimes if I see that person at the conference and they show up with family or they show up in relationship and that's all they say to me is, hey, I'm married now, right? So it may give me some context to the relationship. Um, but usually what I'm writing is obviously nothing too specific about the individual, but something to the, the effect of, even turbulence can bring peace. You know, the path forward, the path through is always the way, right? So, um, and, and gratitude, right? Thank you for investing and committing in the journey towards your healing, right? Because by showing up, by acknowledging this writing, by bringing yourself forward to support this work and mental health, we're not, you know, yes, we may be, you know, client therapist, but we're also sharing and bringing the same path forward. And I know I'm supporting you and bringing this to your life. So I'm reminding them, you know, that they are a light to their family and an inspiration to everyone they touch through doing, through leading forward. I always want to remind the clients and those that come forward, right? That you are a leader by choosing this path. And so I, I'm inspired. And usually I'm inspired by them. I want to thank them and just let them know they're giving back to me. Okay. Now, you've done your thing on the West Coast. We'll give you California. You didn't have to go to Washington or <laughs> anywhere else. You move over to the Midwest. And when we do Midwest, we're not talking Texas. We're going to talk somewhere that has perennial power. Ohio State. Columbus, Ohio. Mm. That's about an hour or 30 minutes up the road for me. So, guys, definitely shout out to y'all in University of Ohio and, and University of Pittsburgh sometimes. So you're at Ohio State. This TED Talk has taken you from the West Coast to the Midwest, which technically Ohio is the end of the Midwest, but we'll just use it anyway. You're about to talk 
to a team that could almost be a national championship football team. They had a little slip up against the University of Michigan. A bad slip up. <laughs> Got Jim Harbaugh a new contract, basically. <laughs> what do you tell this team going into, and this is outside the TED Talk, they brought you in on a special assignment. They brought you in to get this team's morale back up after that horrible, and I'm talking about ridiculous loss to Michigan. How do you build this team up to go play in the college playoffs? What's the first 10 words you say to them? 10 words. Ten. We learn about ourselves through adversity. Our opponents teach us and show us the path forward for where we need to enhance our focus. So it is a gift to experience defeat. How we respond to it is the opportunity. Okay, and I like that. Now, Ohio State uh, felt very good about you. So <laughs> so then something else came about. Um, in the sports psychology world, you're revered, but you're getting closer to the East Coast, and somehow you end up in Baltimore, John Hopkins University. You're amongst millions, not millions, we'll say 2,000 sports psychologists you now from across the world. And you're given the opportunity to tell them about the Zero Method, the book. What do you say to some of these fellow sports psych psychologists that you see out here? And, you know, there's going to be students and different stuff there, but what do you say to them? Because those are your peers. Those are people that dissect your work without you even knowing. Hmm. Um, what I say to them is, you know, sometimes they say, keep it simple, stupid, right? We've got a lot of textbooks out there. There's a lot of performance plans. There's a lot of things that look at how to get you to, you know, focus uh, and get ready for your performance. But the purpose of the zero method is to treat the man or the person beyond the athlete. That sometimes, right, there's no separating what's going on in the house or in the family of that athlete that you're working with or the team you're working with. There's no separating what they've been through collectively from the athlete you're treating. So without if you want to be the best version of a sports psychologist, then you have to look at what's beyond the mask. And this is a tool to help the athletes show themselves so they can bring it to you. You don't have to be the one who dissects, inspects, forces therapy upon them. This is the gift of self-reflection. This awesome. is the gift of self-awareness. <laughs> so this is and this is the so the zero method is your tool to do it. And, and I like that. Now, audience, um, it has been a pleasure to have you, Richard, on the show. Um, so audience, this is what I want you to do real quick. One last time we're gonna hit a shameless plug real fast. At Richard Listens, Instagram, blow me up, send me a message, let me know how to help you. Um all the podcasts are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Look up Richard Listens uh, and older versions, Richard Listens on Sports, if that's what you love. Come check out Book Signing at the Grove in Los Angeles. If you're here on January 15th, Sunday, 12 to 2 p.m. at Barnes & Noble and pick up a copy of The Zero Method on Amazon or KDP, uh, wherever you prefer to get or read your book. Thank you so <laughs> much for having me. And you're welcome. Now, audience, real quick, let's take a, a quick reflection real quick on this episode. This episode had Richard Olberger on here talking about the zero method, talking about sports psychology, talking about literally skid row, all the way um, to previously working in a crisis center, handling amounts, massive amounts of power and dictating where people had to go, what they needed to do to be superb. Almost like the TV show 911, if you want to go into deeper detail. Um, and I'm talking about the Jennifer Love Hewitt portion. And uh, a great thing that we'll, we'll take here is this. And, and, and this is the testimony of Richard here. Richard uh, got powerful at one point. 
got a little boastful in his own life. But he learned one key thing. Humility. And he took that humble stick and he hit himself a few times with it. And he got himself in line. Then the next thing he did is something that is very courageous. He stepped out on a limb. He took his psychology background and helped people in sports management and other areas during COVID-19. He went above and beyond himself. Those workers, those people, they're the unsung heroes. We don't hear about them. People talk about them here and there. But after a while, in the day and age where we are now, it's not that they're forgotten, but they're not acknowledged. So we're acknowledging you. Um, I want you to take that with you, put it inside a bottle, manufacture it, pass it along in the world, because we need more people like you. If we don't have people like you, um, the world won't exist. It won't. The wheels will not turn. The sprockets won't move. Spacely sprockets will not be in business. So, <laughs> so forever and a day, keep being who you are, Richard. And the people, the foundations that you build for other people, that's the most amazing thing you can take away from life, is that you've helped people take care of their foundation if they have to rebuild on it. And not a lot of people get to help people re rebuild or even work on a foundation. Some people come in in the middle, blah, 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 but you go from the bottom to the top and it takes a lot out of you. It's a lot of self-care that you got to do for yourself that the world will never know about. Maybe you'll let them know in another episode how you take care of yourself. So with that, that's your testimony right there. And, and I hope you can keep that with you and it goes real far. Now, audience, you'll be able to listen to this podcast. You'll be able to watch it on Twitch. You'll be able to catch it on YouTube at some point. Um, we're going to do everything we can to get this episode polished and nice looking for you guys. And you guys will have it in some kind of format that works for you. I am JR from West Virginia Uncommonplace, and we are signing off.